Hi, I'm uh, Susan Camel, um, and I am Joanne Ramos's editor, and I'm here to introduce her. But first, I want to, since I'm the last one, I just want to thank all our colleagues in the library marketing department for bringing all of you together for all of us publishers and writers here today because um, the spirit in the room really is fabulous and um, you do such important work in our community, more important now than ever and I just personally want to thank you on behalf of Random House um, because it's been a really lovely time being here with you and with some amazing writers. So. Um, so from the first page of Joanne Ramos' uh, brilliant debut, The Farm, you know you're in the hands of a writer with ingenuity and heart, a writer who has the talent to drop you into a world that is both foreign and familiar, with a heroine you can root for from the very first page. Joanne's take on what a financially desperate young single mother from the Philippines will do to ensure the future of her baby, daughter, will move you, it will startle you, it will make you think, and most of all, it will make you wonder about the choices you yourself might make should you be in her shoes. I finished reading The Farm at some very late hour of the day. Uh, I received the uh, manuscript from Joanne's agent, and I was stunned by the mix of feelings that the novel evoked. I was, of course, blown away by Joanne's fantastic prowess as a storyteller, of course, but. Um, <coughs> but more through the twists and turns experienced by her vivid cast of characters, the farm opened my eyes to issues of race and class in ways I had never before considered. There are impromptu book club discussions all over Random House as a result of this book, um, and opinionated emails all the time, and just the sort of fully engaged conversation that we as publishers hope will happen as we prepare for what I know is going to be a very noisy and very successful publication. I envy you the reading experience for the first time. Joanne. Uh, first, thank you to Susan. And thank you to all of you for coming. I know it's a really busy time of the year uh, to make time for all of us. Um, and it really is a great pleasure for me to be here speaking to you because libraries have always been a real refuge for me. A clean, well-lighted place where I've whiled away many an afternoon, surrounded by one of the things I love best in the world, and that's books. I grew up in southeastern Wisconsin in a uh, town called Racine. And the Racine Public Library uh, is right on Lake Michigan in the downtown area. We emigrated from the Philippines when I was six, and it was in the late 1970s, in the wake of a rash of um, auto manufacturing closings in the area. So downtown Racine, and Racine in general really, was pretty run down at that point. And what I remember about moving into our subdivision, uh, which was about a 15 minute drive from the library, um, it was in the outskirts of her scene, uh, was the flatness of all those quarter acre lots and the one tree that the developer plunked down in front of our aluminum sided house. And it was such a spinely tree and it looked so impermanent. And so at a time when me and my family were getting used to so much, a new life in a new country, books were my refuge. And the places that housed those books, a lot, our library, um, was really a place of comfort. So because it was a little bit of a drive from where we lived, we would go on the weekends. Um, my mom and dad would stay upstairs and they would look through the stacks of VHS cassettes to see if they can find some musicals they like and pick up their books and read there. I just have to say, as a total aside, um, my dad loved Louis L'Amour. So when I found out this is the name of the conference room, I took a he passed away a couple of years, I took a picture, I sent it to my parents. I'm like, he's watching over my debut. So, um, and my little sister and I would make a beeline for downstairs. That's where the kids section was. Now during the, weeks when we, the weekends when we couldn't make it to the library, Joyce, my little sister, and I would beg my mom to do her grocery shopping on Wednesdays because that's when the library's bookmobile parked in front of our Piggly Wiggly, which is where we did our food shopping. And to be honest, the trips to the bookmobile weren't quite as great. There was no room to lounge around with your book. The selection was understandably limited because it was just a big van chock full of a little bit of everything. But at least we got a fresh dose of books for the week. Um, and once in a while, um, the librarian there would recommend something that we actually loved. So. It's better than nothing. 
Um, so reading really was one of the constants of my childhood, but it was never enough. I, I always wanted to write, and from the second that I could form words, I did write, or at least copy, because it's before I was like four. Um, before we moved to the States, it was normally Disney board books that I would copy. Once we got to a scene, there was a publishing house there, I don't know if it still is, it's called Golden Books Publishing. And uh, my parents loved to support local businesses, and they always had sales, so we had stacks of those books, and I would copy them word for word before I could write my own narrative and illustrate them. I got my first diary and my first communion when I was seven, and I kept a diary off and on ever since, because I always felt compelled to write. Um, in fact, when my parents finally sold our childhood home six or seven years ago, I got this enormous plastic bin in the mail here in New York, and it's chock full of all the diaries I've kept through college. And I picked one up. Unfortunately, it was one from seventh or eighth grade. It was so painful to read because that's such a painful time. Uh, the only reason all those diaries aren't moldering in a landfill somewhere is that my husband wouldn't let me toss them. So given this love of writing and reading, you'd think um, I would have written my whole life. But actually, when I started writing The Farm in my 40s, it had been a full 20 years uh, since I had written a story. And I've been thinking about that, about why that was. And I think it's because for me, although I loved words and making things up, um, that resided in a whole different space. Um, the real world was where you have to be practical and you had to make it. Um, but even though I hadn't written all that time, all the ideas of the farm, um, all these ideas and observations had been accruing really um, my whole life. So as I mentioned before, I grew up in Wisconsin from the age of six. It was this funny dual existence because during the weeks, for instance, my little sister and I were fully half of the Asians in our big public elementary school. Uh, the other two were these Korean brothers. But on the weekends, we would visit my dad's family in a town about 20, 30 minutes away, and we were part and parcel of a really small but tight Filipino community there. In fact, my sense of family, what it means to be with family, is really from those weekends. Being with family is a lot of food, and you're always being forced to eat, and it's clamorous, and it's loud, and it's warm, and it's kind of invasive, but you always know that you're, you have a place. Uh, for college, I got out of town, uh, went out east, and I got into Princeton. And it really was a dream come true for me and our family. Uh, it was also a real eye-opener. Um, it was the first time I'd met kids my age who would never have to support themselves. The first time I understood that summer is also a verb. The first time I was asked, where do you summer? I was like, in Wisconsin. I just told you I'm from Wisconsin. Um, <laughs> ever practical. I did not even consider majoring in creative writing or English. Um, I did economics and poli-sci. And then took a job in finance afterwards, in part to pay off debt, but in part because I really felt what I should be doing is being practical and learning practical skills. And I have to say, my time in finance totally blew my world open even more, um, especially the stint I did in private equity. Um, part of this is that uh, I was the first woman that this leveraged bio shop had hired, and so I start to see the working world through the prism of penetrating that old boys club. Um, and part of it uh, was because it was high finance. I was suddenly flying private jets places, and we had lunch every day. Me and my male colleagues, um, our gourmet chef would make it for us. And if I was up too late the night before working on an Excel spreadsheet, I could call our in-house masseuse, and she would come in and work on my shoulders while I finished up work. It was a totally different world. Uh, I did manage to break away from finance and start writing in my later 20s, but even then I was ever practical and I um, covered finance. Uh, I was in financial journalism. And then I started having kids in my 30s. And if any of you are parents, you know there's a lot of practicalities involved with raising three young kids. And I was home for a little bit of time. And I realized a couple things uh, during this period. The first is that New York City parents, in our zeal to give our kids the best of everything, can be totally crazy. And the second thing is that the Filipina nannies and housekeepers and baby nurses who I came to knew, know in my new orbit were the only Filipinos that I knew in Manhattan at that period of my life. And it was a really weird realization the day that that, that dawned on me. And I became with friends with some of these women and they would tell me their stories about kids that they'd left behind in Manila and supported from afar or the dormitory that two of my new friends lived in where they rented beds by the half day to save money. And it all just reinforced this feeling that I'd harbored for some time, really since college, that what separated my life from theirs, an easier and ostensibly more successful one, for one deemed less so by the world at large, had as much to do with luck as it did with any kind of merit. And it was around this time that my youngest, my third child, was off to junior kindergarten. I had my days free. And I realized I wanted to write about all this stuff that I'd been thinking about for so long. Um, I didn't want to go back to The Economist. I wanted to give it a go. And I'd always wanted to write a book, but I'd just been too busy being practical or probably a little scared to really try. 
And so I started writing every day. Uh, I just couldn't find my way into all of these ideas and themes until I came across an article in the Wall Street Journal over a year later. And it was about a surrogacy facility in India. It was a place where Westerners were hiring Indian women to carry their babies. And the what ifs just started percolating. What if I made the surrogates um, not just women from India, but a cross-section of the nannies I met in Tribeca's parks? What if I made the clients not just wealthy Westerners, but the richest of the richest of the rich? And so the farm was born. If you hire a host, as I call the surrogates, to carry your baby, you can rest assured that your baby will get the best of everything. From the cleanest air, because the farm's located on over 260 of the prettiest, most pristine acres you've ever seen in the rural Hudson Valley. The best doctors, of course, the best food, all organic, really the best wounds that money can buy because of the army of nutritionists and psychiatrists and fitness trainers at the ready to make sure your hosts are in tip-top shape. In fact, in utero, your baby gets an edge because of all these things that they've come up with at the farm, like um, a system where they can pump everything from Mozart's symphonies to Steve Jobs' speeches to Shakespeare into the womb. And so Jane, who's one of my narrators, um, is a woman with very few options. She's a young Filipina, her husband just left her, and she just got let go from a baby nursing job. And she hears about the farm, and she wants to give her baby daughter a better life, and she thinks, how hard can it be? I've already carried a baby. At least this way, I have the chance of making huge money, the kind of money that will change her life for good. And so she goes through the arduous process of getting selected, is selected, and she signs on. But what she realizes is that it's not as easy as she thought. For one, there's nothing easy about being monitored and scrutinized and poked and prodded 24-7. There's nothing easy about living with a room full, a house full, really, of strangers for nine months, particularly when you're reserved like she is, and particularly when they're so different from you. And there's nothing easy about being cut off from her daughter. And when she starts to get signs and hints that all is not that well in Queens where she left her baby uh, with a relative, um, she becomes ever more desperate to leave the farm and make sure her little girl is okay. But what she realizes is that when she signed away those nine months of her life, she signed away all control over nine months of her life. And the question becomes, what's she going to do and what she's willing to sacrifice? I hope you enjoy it. Um, thank you for all that you do and for being here.